Hello, Damien. Hello, how are you? I'm fine, how are you? I'm good. Hello, this everybody. This is not our first time speaking. We have interviewed before. Cool. You remember? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Your eyes just I got do. that look. Yeah. I know that I... look because I've given that look. It's fine. It's totally fine. And this is our first time meeting. David, how are you? I'm fine. How are you enjoying Niagara Falls? I'm having a great time. It got cold, though, today. Yeah. Sure did. Another it's beautiful. Oh Every time I come here, I'm astonished at how much colder it is by the water, just by virtue of being near the water. Mm-hmm. I dislike it. Uh, why are you late? <laughs> we have a schedule on our table. It tells us everything we're doing this weekend, and it mm-hmm. said 2.30 today. Okay. Yeah. So, so who, somebody lied. Somebody. somebody has to pay. <laughs> and somebody who will needs it be, a visit from our And how clown. will we make them pay? God forbid they have boobs because I'm cutting them off and wearing them. <laughs> <laughs> I've worn them too. It's fun. <laughs> Some would say it's titillating. <laughs> I have great memories of that moment. Oh, my. That makes one of us. That was the most awkward day on set by far. <laughs> I can imagine. And it remains like such well, a talked about scene. Well, I always say... We weren't making Terrifier at that time. Like, part two, everybody knew what Terrifier was now. They wanted to be involved in it. But part one, we're just making this really obscure killer clown movie, and it's like 4 o'clock in the morning, and it's like, yeah, he's going to be wearing tits and other stuff tonight. And it was the first night that Samantha, I think, worked with him, and mm-hmm. she didn't know what he looked like. She showed up to that, and it was the first <laughs> time. Like, Hello. And I'm watching him, you know, <laughs> telling him to, like, prance around like this, come up the steps, and I'm just, like, by the monitor, like, what? fucking movie am i making like what am i putting these people through so that was interesting what fucking movie are you making is so apt because i think for all of us who were watching it we were like oh shit this is a practical effects gory slasher indie thrill ride and just when you think you figured this film out and you know what you're in for there are the tits and it just <laughs> throws you on your ass because you're like is this some kind of gender bending sleep away camp what does this mean what does this communicate what does this entail and then it just kind of never comes yeah. back to that <laughs> so it's just a one-two punch well you don't also realize it's not just the 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 the, the, the uh, uh tatas that i'm wearing i'm also wearing the meow meow <laughs> <laughs> so i got the moomoos and the meow meow yeah. <laughs> we, we tried to keep it in the shadows as yeah. much as possible i missed it yeah. Yeah. I missed it. Go it, back. It's, it's excuse yeah. to go those, back. Uh, internal organs. Earmuffs. Earmuffs. <laughs> right? nah. You know what it is, though? Like... Right in front of me, and I'm like, oh. She's from Ottawa. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> it's interesting how that how that started. It started with uh, the idea of him wearing a wig. Okay. And then, you know, it was like, well, he wouldn't be wearing a wig, right? He'd be wearing a scalp. Uh-huh. And then it just keeps going. It's like, well, would Art only take the scalp? Or like, he'd probably take more. Mm-hmm. And uh, so I was like, he'll take everything that's I identifiable, know, you know, uh, from her <laughs> as a female. Uh, and I was going to have him wear it over his costume originally. Mm-hmm. And maybe like a couple of weeks before we started shooting, I was like, that's not going to be as effective. I was like, what if he just put them on his naked body? And, uh, you know, I like pushing it and taking risks. Like, you never take Freddy or Michael Myers or Jason, like, out of their costume, especially naked. And mm. I'm like, that might be something really cool to do with this character. And I called up Dave, like, two weeks earlier, and I told him the idea. I'm like, would you be at cool playing this naked? And there's, like, a little awkward pause, and he goes, yeah. <laughs> All right. <laughs> he goes, you know what? He goes, Catherine's going to get naked and get cut in half. He's like, okay. if she's going to do it, I'll take one for the team, too. And that was, like, such an amazing thing and a testament to him. You know, as an actor and as a person, it says a lot about his character, especially since he was never in a movie before, uh, really. And then to yeah. ask him to do that and to, for him to agree to it was amazing. Also, the, the trust that was yeah. there was, was wonderful. I've always been really self-conscious about my body, too. So I was like, well, this is going to be very therapeutic. Yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> Imagine having tits. At least you had a nice pair. <laughs> they were very nice. They were very nice. <laughs> Those were Puyas. Those really were. Yeah. They were molded off of Puya. So <laughs> kudos to Puya. Um. <laughs> Damien, I'm glad you brought up uh, Freddy and Jason and the Pantheon. Because this panel is called A New Slasher Icon, and that is exactly what we've seen in art. And uh, he's not the first clown, but I think we would all agree that he is very singular and very iconic. And so um, earlier this weekend, I was doing a panel with the ladies of Evil Dead, the original Evil yeah, Dead. I just met them. They're wonderful. They're wonderful. Yeah. And when you're talking to them, they were like, it was like a student film. It was, we met them at the back of a diner. We bought lunch. Mm-hmm. Like, we had no idea this thing would blow up and become <laughs> this iconic thing that it has. And so I'm curious, to what extent was that the spirit of the set? of the Like, I know it started as a short 
I, I know it kind of had a trajectory uh, indeed before David even got uh, on board. Mm-hmm. Uh, did you feel like you were creating a new slasher icon? Did you think about the longevity of this character or were you just thinking about the task at hand? You, uh, you always hope that you're doing something worthwhile and especially if you're the writer right everybody thinks oh this is really cool like i'm doing something cool but then it turns out not to be of course but there should always be a lot of passion behind it when i first created him for the first short film that he was ever in that i made called the ninth circle he was one of many characters in it art the clown was just in the opening three minutes uh because i had this little creepy idea for a killer clown i wanted to take my crack at it so it wasn't until i designed the character on paper and I thought he looked pretty cool and then when I put Mike Gianelli in the costume and in the prosthetic and had him on set for the first time it was like wow that's really striking like that looks it has a presence you know Mm -hmm. and then to see him with the creepy smile and it was just working but I didn't know what it was still and then people would see that and their reaction to it was so amazing and they just kept saying what's the deal with that clown that can't be it you have to go make more things with that character so then I was like all right I'll make a short film next with him that focuses solely on this character it's just dedicated to him and I loved slashers so I'm like I'm gonna turn him into a slasher and take bits and pieces of all the slashers that I love kind of be my love letter to everything I grew up with Mm -hmm. and that's when I sort of had the the light bulb realization making that like oh there is something special here I need to get this character in front of as many eyes and get him into a feature Mm -hmm. Um, but I mean it's even into Terrifier 2 it's been that original evil dead guerrilla filmmaking style to Mm -hmm. a T Yes, which I, is yeah. remarkable considering how successful it is. And, and I, I'm going to want to get to that as we get to, further into the sequels and what's obviously becoming a huge franchise, a huge money-making franchise that you're still going to want to keep punk rock and indie, and I know that much. Yeah. But, but, but going back to art and the development of art, obviously this is a character that you have been working on and picking away at through several permutations and several actors. And so um, I wanted to ask to what extent... Uh, David, did you have uh, input on arts? Um, obviously, you were picking up on, um, on on how the character was written and what Damien had le- left off, but there's some of you in there, isn't there? Oh, yeah, definitely, definitely so, because I'm a mischievous little scamp myself. <laughs> so, But, um, yeah, I, I definitely, at uh, first, you know, um, I was already a fan of All Hallows' Eve. I had actually seen it before I even knew about the auditions for Terrifier. Is that right? Yeah, yeah. Where did I you find it? I had just seen it, like, on my, my roommate uh, is a big, huge horror guy. He's like, dude, you'd love this. Okay. Watch this thing. There's this creepy clown and stuff. And so I was, I was like, okay, I'll watch it. I was like, oh, I love this guy. He's like an evil Mr. Bean. What a cool character. <laughs> All right. I, I was like, man, that would be fun to be able to play a character like that one day. I think I could do a lot of fun stuff with him. And then this audition came up, and I was like, oh, my God, now I can. Okay, cool. And so, you know, Mike set a really great foundation for me to build off of. But, you know, my thing was, like, he's a clown. I want to add more of the clowning aspect to him because my background has always been in, like, comedy, especially physical comedy. And so I wanted to bring more of that aspect to the character because I felt that that would, like, differentiate him from all these other silent killers that had come before him. Because you, you, you have that silent, you know, nature of, like, you know, Jason and Michael Myers in him. But then you, I can add more of that personality and that charisma that Chucky and Freddy and those guys had. So I said, like, that will be a fun, unique way to do that. And, you know, he was very open to let me just play around with him and stuff like that. And it's like, I think, like, where we really first really found the character where he's going to live was when we were doing the pizzeria scene. And it's like, just, I, I just, just playing around a lot in that scene that night. He let me improvise a lot, especially with all the faces and stuff like that. And, and he, I think he said something about, like, me just walking away at that one point when I got up after, like, messing with, you know, putting the ring on the finger and I just walked away and instead of just doing my... You know, a normal walk. I had a little jaunty little, little step that I, well, I didn't even think about it. I just did it, and he's like, "I like that," <laughs> and I, that's where it, the the character really came to live in my head from then on. It's like, okay, this is where this guy lives. So yeah, yeah. Yeah, because Mike Gianelli played him kind of straight and stoic, and it was more more like a man dressed as a clown. And now David really turned him into a clown. And when we were filming that scene in particular. That's like he said, you know, he skipped away to the to the bathroom, like very, very over the top and theatrical. And at first I was like, ooh, that's like a little too much. It's a little too like on the nose clown. Then I said, ooh, but you know what? I mean, that's like there's so much character there. There's like more depth now or there's more personality. And I said, you know, we don't necessarily have to do that all the time, but I know that's there now. And Dave gives a whole broad spectrum of performance 
to choose from. And sometimes I take those moments and sometimes I tell them to strip it all away and keep them very kind of just cold and sinister. Um, and then when I get to the editing room, it's like I can mold the performance really like See a piece of works. clay. And so, mm-hmm. Yeah, it's wonderful. It's, fr- it's fun to e- explore. It really is. Yeah. We do a lot of that. We're like we'll do serious takes and then he's sometimes he's like, okay, Dave, now just play. Yeah. yeah. See so what we come up with. And so he's got plenty of options to go with. Mm-hmm. And it's, and, you yeah. know, it's, it's, it's cool. A, we, we have sometimes like a whole movie in itself of just outtakes. Outtakes, sure, sure. Yeah. yeah. That sounds like a blast. And like my podcast just did a retrospective of the two it iterations Mm -hmm. uh the original like tim curry's performance as pennywise and then pennywise 2.0 and like one of the biggest differences is the physicality of the clowning and how off-putting it is and particularly for art who is a silent character Mm -hmm. has there ever been any like have you ever thought like one day he'll break his silence and one day like Hmm. art will drop a line a freddy krueger (laughs) one-liner that'll send us all into hysterics (laughs) we yeah Kind of, kind of like Marcel Marceau in a silent movie. <laughs> what do you think he'd say? If art could speak. <laughs> Hello, kitties. <laughs> Crypt keeper. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry I'm late. <laughs> Sorry I'm late. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Whoops. <laughs> All right, guys, I've got a ton of questions, but I know you've been waiting and you probably have some too. Let's get some hands up if you have anything to ask these guys. Otherwise, we're going to keep talking shit like we have a mouthful. Right here. Just, uh, in part two, the uh, whip that you're using, is that supposed to, is it supposed to be the hair from all your victims that are... Yes. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yes. Yeah. I love that aspect of it. I, I think yeah. that's, that just makes it a little bit more special. It's just very macabre. Yeah, I actually, I got that from, I believe it or not, I took that from Boba Fett from Star Wars. Because uh, if you really dig into that character, like, you would never know in the movie, but if you, like, break down his, you know, his character, his mythology or whatever, he has Wookiee braids on his shoulder from the Wookiees that he's killed, and he keeps it as trophies. And I was like, oh, I like that idea. So I kept that, and I mixed it with the uh, flagellum from The Passion of the Christ when I saw that movie. That really stood out to me. So I was like, I'll, you know, make my version of that. And that's where I came from, yeah. You are such a nerd. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. Sean, what's your question? Go ahead. When you were um, developing the original Terrifier, was it always your intention to place the chronology and your expectation on who the final girl was? Yeah, yeah. I wanted, um, I wanted his character, <clears throat> sorry, to be so unpredictable. And the movie takes a turn in the middle, of course, when we, you know, kind of do a Janet Lee psycho. And he, you think Tara is going to be the final girl. And then he pulls out the gun and kills her. And it's like the... Whoops. Yeah. It's, yeah. It's the most unfair thing he does in the movie. It's like a very polarizing thing. Like, it's where the whole movie kind of shifts. And it's, it's an experience to be with an audience in a theater when that happens. Because the audible sound that comes out is just a combination of screams, laughter, boos. Like, I never heard anything like it. Uh, so that's cool. But I, that's supposed to be his character. I'd never want you to feel comfortable with him. And you never know what he's going to do next. And nobody should feel safe around him. So I thought that was a great way to set him up. I still love when that guy just yelled out, bullshit! <laughs> I was like, yes, that's the reaction. Because I, I'm, that night we were filming that, I'm like, this is going to really tick off a lot of people. Someone in the audience yeah. jumped up and yelled bullshit? Yeah, someone did. And I was like, that's fantastic. Because yeah. that's the thing. It's like, we, I, I, I love that element of surprise because no one's going to expect that. I was like, we are going to, like, because we're breaking a convention with him using a gun in the first place, but we're also going to kill off whoever I think is the final girl. Yeah. And I'm like, oh my God, that's going to, Ooh, I, lo- I can't wait. I was I was waiting for that moment the first time we saw that with an audience. Yeah. Well, let's talk about uh, about the final girl. And if, you know, um, if, if we're going to take the name of this panel on its premise, that this is like a, a new modern slasher, um, what were your thoughts on the final girl trope and how did you subvert slash adhere to that at the same time? Oh, I think it's just such a crucial part of this genre I, I, I and, and that's why I mean part one was really a showcase for art because it was so low budget again nobody knew what Terrifier was and I make it I make the movie as this is my only shot to get people's attention so I'm just gonna like throw every insane thing at the wall and really just put Art the Clown in your face and just be like, do you like this guy? Do you like what he has to offer? And again, at that moment in the movie, that's where it shifts and Art really becomes the star of the film. It's really his movie. Um, But 
you need a worthy adversary. You need a protagonist to really be able to take on this character and to be a counterpart. So bring out the worst in them. Yeah, for sure. And uh, and I had, I mean, and that you know that leads into terrifier too with sienna because i've had that character in my head for a long time especially just visually because i love i always start with images to characters really like uh that's just i'm a visual i visualize everything i like sort i don't like throwing the word iconic out but like i love just memorable images just striking images so i always wanted to do that with the final girl where everybody puts the the villain on a pedestal, but meanwhile, the, the final girl is really the star of all these movies. So I wanted to see if I could do that with the final girl and kind of put her on that level and have her look amazing and have her be like a real badass, you know, to go up against this character. So it's super important, you know, and it's just, it's part of the formula and it's, uh, it makes it so much more powerful. So. Well, the tricky thing about that formula, as I'm sure you're aware, is that if the final girl survives for too long... The audience gets a little pussy in their pants. And then you've got to kill them off and bring them back and prequels and sequels. And I don't suppose you want to reveal what your plans are for Sierra. No, I can't. I can't reveal my plans. Yeah. But at the same time, you know, I don't want to make too many movies where I just start. I always say the well just runs dry and we're running out of ideas and you're just making them just to make them or just to make them for profit. Uh, Because then that's what happens with a lot of these franchises. They just lose their way. And now, because they never have a goal in sight. There's never an end game. It's just people love the killer. Just keep giving them the killer. But then when you go back and you finally have a franchise and you can sit down and you have a movie night and you're like, let's watch the whole, you know, X franchise, whatever it is. And then you're like, what is the point of that character? I just followed him or her for eight movies, and they just petered out, or they just died off, or and now the killer's just killing another slew of people. It's like, what is the overall story? Why am I here? Why am I invested in these characters? So I want to be able to have a franchise that um, I could look at as an artist and just be proud of and know where it begins and where it ends. Mm-hmm. Um, and then no matter what, somebody else will eventually pick this up, and they'll reboot it, and they'll make a thousand more, or maybe I'll come up with another idea eventually be like you know what I, I found a way to come back in and make something satisfying you never know but I really want that solid sort of saga that I could tell and just step away from but it. Terrifier 3 is a thing oh absolutely okay yeah, yeah, okay yeah. oh it's a thing and it's a it's a Christmas thing I'm sure you guys have heard it's almost <laughs> astonishing to me that you've even been able to keep it so real up till now because with such a smash hit I'm sure the big studios have been sniffing around like the vultures that they are they have are yeah. you able to tell me like the <clears throat> stupidest offer that you've had to say no to like has disney come up to you and been like we want to put art the cloud oh in the fucking ice capades or something <laughs> like no or believe it or not scary there no i can't give any specifics of people i've met with but I've, I've met with major studios a lot which is totally a totally new experience for me which was really cool like a week in la going to all these places and they all love terrified like how did you do it how did you do it for like so, so little money we think it's great but the the consensus i was sort of getting is you know if we take this it's got to be within sort of these parameters. Like you have to water it down or you have to kind of change the title. We don't like Terrifier 3 for your next one. It's got to be like a sort of a reboot, almost like a soft reboot. I was getting that a lot. Um, yeah, just really things from like, there's just no way. It doesn't matter how much money you throw at me. That's just not happening. Nice. Um, and basically, I mean, it, it was no matter who I met, there was just something that was like, oh, I just want this to be mine. I don't want people over my shoulder. It's like, that's, the reason why we're here is because I never had those those limitations or those restrictions. So eventually, we just kept it in-house. So it's still us making it. I mean, it's the distributor, Cinedime, who put out, who distributed Part 2. And they were the ones who believed in it, regardless of the runtime and it being unrated. Uh, they were like, yeah, let's get it into the movie theaters. I was like, the movie theaters? Like, All right, cool. Um, so <laughs> like, never thought that was a possibility. Um, but that was all of them. And now they're the ones behind it. And again... Basically, it's whatever you did for part two, do it again. Like, that's it, and we'll step back. Uh, and I think that's that's the way to go, honestly. So I'm excited. You guys are going to love what we have in store for you. That's really I have cool. no doubt. Like, you watch, you watch Terrifier, and you're like, how can they up the ante? How can they possibly... <laughs> 
exceed right. expectations here. Yeah. And like, I consider myself a pretty jaded horror fan. I yeah. thought I had seen it all. Terrifier 2 had this tendency to, oh, oh shit, that was fucked up. Okay, that's the fucked up thing. And now I'm ready for some reprieve before we get to the next fucked up thing. But it would go further. And it just, <laughs> it, it's, it's really something special. It's something oh. fresh. And like, again, going back to Evil Dead, it has that... That magic, it has that authenticity that I think we were really uh, missing in, in in horror in the years leading up to it. Um, and Thank David, you. I imagine you must be so close to the character now. Mm-hmm. It must feel very um, territorial for you. But is there anything that Damien could ask you to do that you'd be like, Art wouldn't do that? Um... Oh, that's a great I, question. Yeah. We've never been asked before. Yeah. No that's my job. Just yeah. doing my job. Get out of I, here. I, I would say anything. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry I was late. <laughs> Jeez. But I, personally, I, I, don't, I don't see him as a sexual creature. I see him as an asexual creature. So I don't see him ever doing anything that would be like in like rape or anything like that. I, I, that mm-hmm. I, I think that would be totally out of character for him. Mm-hmm. It's like, even though, you know, you look I at I guess them, he's out of Terrifier 4. Oh, no! <laughs> <laughs> That's just going to be What is it? The porn spinoff yeah. we never wanted. <laughs> <laughs> Deep throat part two oh, or geez. something like that. It was like, I was like, earmuffs. <laughs> See, that's so interesting because, again, like that goes back to that boobs scene where it was just kind of like, it's sort of sexual violence, but, but it wasn't. Not. But it's not. That was that, that. That's how I view that. I don't see that as him being, you know, that, that was more about not, what he was doing was trying to debase her and try to really – more not really wasn't doing anything to her per se it was more about what he could do to Tara cuz i felt like he was really trying to like he, what he was doing in part 2 he was really trying to break down Sienna there's a reason he's trying to break down Sienna you know really trying to just destroy her mentally and there's a reason for that and he was trying to do the same thing to Tara and what what can i well, i'm going to do this to her best friend right in front of her this horrible 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 thing like this plus it's also hard to get a hacksaw through clothing so you have to make it easier <laughs> so i mean logistics <laughs> you know art's a smart guy so that that's how i viewed it it's like that he's going to do whatever he can to really debase a person and break them down mentally and mm-hmm. that's one of those things you would do to somebody that had nothing to no, no sexual connotation to it at all i think yeah, I think the best horror is the one that busts taboos that we don't even realize that we hold. And so breasts are so sexualized when they are really just bags of meat. And so so I thought it was so inventive um, that we went that way with it. But Terrifier 3 as a Christmas movie. Yeah. Talk about the holiest of holies, the most sanctified time of the year. Mm. Tell me that art isn't going to dress up like Santa because I will flip uh-huh. this table. I can't, I can't tell you. <laughs> you better watch. You better you see watch. the uh, see the teaser. <laughs> now, being set around Halloween time has given you so much license to have art right. move freely right. in the that world. That was the main reason why. But I did also take to build up your, yeah. your 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 counterpoints. Your final girls are often in costume, which which mm. then become iconic in their own. Yeah. Um, how's that gonna work? It, I, Christmas is my second favorite holiday. Obviously, Halloween is going to be my favorite. But this character just lends himself to that that holiday, that setting. I mean, he's already walking around with a sack full of toys, you know, and he loves to give presents. Um, and just blood and snow and just all the sadistic, you know, the sadistic things he could do with those tropes. Mm-hmm. Um, and like you said, it's a very holy holiday as well. And... You know he's a very sadistic, satanic character at this point. Basically, Nothing's there's a lot of there's a lot of demon, um, you know, lore and mythology going on right okay. now as well. So we can tap into that arena. Uh, but I just love put. He could work his way into almost any setting, any situation. Um, but this one's going to be especially fun, and there's a lot of great set pieces in this. Oh, I would love. And to I'm see. just uh, and I'm obsessed with that subgenre of horror. Uh-huh. Um, so like my favorite Christmas horrors are of course the original Black Christmas and the Tales from the Crypts, like the, the movie from the '70s, the anthology, the Joan Crawford one, and then they remade it in the '90s. The Robert Zemeckis did it, uh, the Tales from the Crypt. So it's going to be like 
the vibe of those three mixed with Terrifier, which is going to be really yeah. exciting. And one, one, yeah. one thing, because it's not really a spoiler, but one thing I really like about this next script, it, I, I really think <clears> it's really showcasing how smart Art is in this one. Because, like, you know, during Halloween, he can walk around normally. That's right. And he could just look like another guy in costume, but now he's got to be a little bit more and a little craftier this time around. All right. So it's just... It, it, that's why I, I love this script. Oh, I'm so excited. <laughs> he, did, he just read it, <laughs> yeah, really, like yeah. a month ago. Uh-huh. Yeah. Had no idea what it was. So that was yeah. a little nerve-wracking, too, because... Like what's it gonna you know what's it gonna be and there's a lot of there's more eyes on this now than ever you know going in from Terrifier one to two it was still very obscure so I right. felt a little more confidence like well I'm sorry about that um, but now this one there's the the expectations and the anticipation so great how they're gonna top it where does it go so yeah. ha- having my cast and crew in the dark and it's just all being kind of on my shoulders mm-hmm. was a little nerve wracking but I was very confident I knew what most of it was gonna be while I was writing part two so mm-hmm. yeah so i'm stoked for it I really yeah. am yeah I'm excited. i would love to see like a terrifier movie take place around like thanksgiving like imagine art just through a feast imagine this spread. more mashed potatoes yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he likes playing with food that's for he sure do. that he do <laughs> listen um, there's christmas feasts as well okay. so. <laughs> okay. audience do you have stuff just throw your hand up hi <clears throat> uh, can we expect Sienna and her little brother to be the main protagonists in Terrifier 3? Or are we gonna, can we expect some new characters? No, we're absolutely following Sienna on her journey. She's so crucial to this franchise. Um, it's just as much hers as it is Arts right now. So seeing her, she's still on this, going through this sort of metamorphosis, which is really exciting to explore. And now the two of them are also dealing with the events of Part 2 and the trauma and just that whole new element the story is so interesting and this whole this whole movie is just so fresh like i always make sure we check the necessary boxes that get us like 60 percent of the way there where i know we're going to have a satisfying movie and then i really like to play and come up with something really unique and original with the rest of it and i think i think we did it yeah. with this one but we do have two final girls in this movie though per se yeah well part one and part two <laughs> girls, so. can't be two true. final girls and they're not final <laughs> yeah well, Victoria. Yep. <laughs> Victoria is... She's, she's coming back! She's, she's got a significant part, yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> she's nice. Okay, okay. Well, David, I need to ask you about a little nugget that I found online. Sorry, we'll get to your question. I promise. I just have to ask because I saw the words Night of the Living Dead 2 mm-hmm. and the What the Fuck <laughs> Factor is on par with Art with Tits. Can you, what, what can you tell us about that? Yeah, The Night of the Living Dead 2. I, I really don't know what's going on with that right now, actually. That was that was something we did a sizzle like trailer for like a few years ago, yeah. and I have no idea what's going on with that right so now. So it exists? It, it exists, but I have no idea what's going on. I, I really don't have any idea. I, because stuff's happened since then, uh-huh. and so that's all stuff like out of my pay grade, so I have no idea. But okay. I, I played a fun little fat zombie in that so that was fun i got to come out of the ocean with a big huge shark bite in the side of me and i think that was probably one of the funniest things i've ever done because oh my god it was (laughs) that that the the suit i'm wearing was just constantly absorbing water so every take i got heavier and heavier and heavier like the second take i'm coming up and my pants fall down and i don't know it and i'm just like going around and like the zombie next to me just pulls up my pants is holding my pants up well i got fish falling out of me and stuff like that the third take i couldn't even stand up in the water and I was just floating. I was like, I looked like a turtle on its back. I'm just like, help, help. <laughs> so it, it just, it, thank God they got it on the first take of me coming out of the water. But it, that was insane. It was like they got all this, all these funny videos of me just trying to get out of that suit too. But it was, uh, we, we made it a little, I think we even made like a, a short movie in it where I was just as a zombie chasing a seagull around the beach. And it was Good. Like, Get those. I didn't shit even hats. know I was being filmed. I was just having fun. Just my, I was bored, and I'm like, I'm gonna go chase this little seagull, and it's like, how are you making that sound? Yeah, I had lunch. 
That's, I, I make sounds. That's my thing. That's the ironic it's not thing your about thing. it. You're it's, known for playing a silent yeah. clown. Yeah. And I, it's, it's the irony. I was like, I, I do over 200 voices. Huh. Yeah. It's just something I do. It's just, ever since I was like, a, the first voice I ever learned how to do was Goofy when I was in first grade. And that, Let's hear it. And it's like, gosh. <laughs> <laughs> like, well, I don't know what do you want me to do here, Mickey. <laughs> it's pretty good. Yeah, it's pretty that, good. Let's hear yeah. your Damien. Oh shit! <laughs> oh shit! <laughs> I, I don't really imitate like normal sounding people. Not in front of them. Like, normal sounding. In front of them. <laughs> yeah, but it's like it's, I'm I'm better with the, the cartoon characters. I'm I'm not like Ross, you know, who does all these great celebrity. I can do a few. So I was like, like I was really known for doing back in college, uh, doing my um, Don Knotts voice. So I was like Barney Fife. And I'm like, well, Andy, you know, you're gonna come into my little town of Mayberry over here, my little this little stupid little clown walking around. Uh, I'm gonna nip him in the bud. Yep, nip him in the bud. Last one, Werner Herzog commenting on Terrifier. I can't do him. Oh, I've never, I've never really tried to David, do him have you before. Tried, I, 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 I have to hear him. It's then, a difficult one. Yeah. It's like Schwarzenegger with a dash well, of doom. Yeah, it's, well, it's like, what is it like? This because he's so German. I just something. I don't. I have to hear him first. Okay. We'll work on it. We'll I could do this Schwarzenegger. If you want me to get in and get out now. The clown. Put the, put the horn down now. And Stone, what are you doing over there? You got a clown coming in. You're honking his horn. I'm going to beat the crap out of you, you know. He's crazy lazy. <laughs> Let's get your question now. Thank you for that. <laughs> no problem. <laughs> I was just wondering if Jericho or Leah is still going to be in the third one. Is that the end? Of the Ooh. Third? Yeah, well, I will say, it's a bit of a spoiler, but we are going to pick up where that left off for sure, and you're going to see how Art gets out of that situation where we last found him. Can't wait. So there's a good, there's a good chance you will see. Jericho again, because he's still he's still working there, watching horror movies and eating that zombie platter, <laughs> yeah. eating those eyeballs. Yep. <laughs> so going back once again to art being a slasher icon, um, one of the uglier aspects of the slasher iconography of the 1980s is that some of these slashers were created to sell toys and to sell merch and to sell Halloween costumes. There is art in filmmaking, obviously, but commercial imperatives do exist um can you tell me the craziest merch offer you've gotten for terrifier or art the craziest one? Oh my gosh i don't know any i mean there's terrifier so... bed sheets <laughs> sure that's not crazy art smash <laughs> underwear <potatoes. laughs> what is the craziest one there's so many see. and there's so many that just are unlicensed that what about one that, well yeah there's like yeah. tea coffee um what else is there um those ones are really... unlicensed well, we have i think those, one of them those, is those but... ba- the baby arts that are really creepy looking that there are you know i, I, think I mean but most sense. of them are pretty normal yeah but they everything. piss you off when you see unlicensed fan merch it, it doesn't i it mean does not. it's no i mean it hurts us a little bit it hurts the people who do you know have um, the license properly and are paying and whatnot but um it's just so wild to see it and to see how much people care uh and are willing to buy it where mm-hmm. you can't help but feel grateful that that's right. you're in that situation nice yeah you had a question so elliot has aged significantly from when you filmed terrifying Wait, Amelie, Amelie, the little pale girl? Elliot. Oh, Elliot, I'm oh, sorry. Elliot, yeah. yeah. So, Puberty. I'm just wondering if you're going to acknowledge that at all in the movie or if it's just going to go. Ooh, that's a great story. question. That's a bit of a spoiler. I think I could say, I think I could say, I guess I can, right? Yeah, yeah this, you so, wrote it. Yeah, <laughs> it doesn't matter. It's not going to hurt anything. This movie's actual, like, a, a, a time jump. So, like, time goes by to where we are not now. Yeah. So, that's how we deal with it fucking kid <laughs> puberty yeah it's all in the neck now he's in college yeah any other questions from the audience uh, all the rumors about 
on the internet about you being interested in Friday the 13th directing? Is it true? Yeah. Whoa, Oh, of course it's true. My God. I mean, that just came out of nowhere, though, all of a sudden. That kind of blew up. I was doing, um, a few days ago, I was doing a block of, uh, like, press for the Terrifier re-release, like a four-hour Zoom block. And one of the one of the places just asked me, you know, if you could direct... Uh, a reboot of your favorite slasher film like what would it be and i was like oh i've been on record for years saying i would love to take a crack at the friday the 13th reboot because jason was always my favorite slasher um friday the 13th i mean uh halloween i love like i love them all so much halloween's been done i wouldn't even know what to do with that now they've made it brutal it's like so fresh i feel like there's things though i could do with Friday the 13th, that would be really fresh and making him, like Jason, really scary again. And I have this cool little twist I would do on his mythology that's awesome, but it wouldn't ruin the mythology that we love. And, you know, making it as brutal as we can. I mean, they would never let me make it as brutal as Terrifier, but, mm. they, you know, we'd push it as far as we can with an R rating. So, but, but that was it. And then the next day, it's just they took that and, like, boom. And then every, uh, you know, outlet just started taking that and reprinting it, you know, reposting it. And it was pretty wild so i love it i love that i'm actually like maybe a better chance that i'm on their radar having seen that so the reaction's been pretty good i mean the thing with friday the 13th is it's stuck in litigation hell yeah over the name and i feel like that's why we will perhaps tragically never again get another friday the 13th anything like even the video game with i know it sucks but at the same time it does beg the question like uh, here you are in a position where you've created this this slasher icon who is silent. And I, I know for myself, when I watched the newfangled Halloween reboot, I was like, this could be anyone. Why does it have to be Michael Myers? Yeah. You know? So do you ever, there's going to have to be a time where you're like, okay, I've done, I've said what I needed to say with terrifier and it's time to lay it down. Wait, I'm sorry. I was just lost in my train of thought right now. I was I just know. thinking, yeah, yeah. wait, you know what I was just Your thinking face about? darkened when I said that. And I'm it, sorry. I'll, I'll get back to that. <laughs> What I was just thinking about is, and I mean this with like the utmost sincerity, there is nobody out there, and I guarantee you this, that would, that loves that character more than more than I do, or more than I did as a kid. Jason, I'm talking about, uh-huh. like the obsession that I had with him at the youngest age. My friend, still like one of my best friends to this day, we grew up on the same block from the time we were three years old. His mother's first memory of me, of my my family moving in on the street is me, three years old, running down the block in Batman underwear and a Jason mask on. <laughs> and she, she just said, who is this kid? Where is his mother? And uh, I don't want him anywhere near my son, basically. And she tells that story all the time. And, I mean, that's true. I mean, I was beyond obsessed. I remember being three years old, four years old, like pausing the movie on the VHS and like studying the mask and like begging my mother, like, can you get me that? Where do you get that mask? And her trying to find a Jason mask. Like, where do you go? You could, now you can get them everywhere. Like yeah. horror convention, the real thing. Yeah. Then you couldn't find a Jason mask. It was impossible. She, so she would go to like a hockey store and buy me like a really shitty goalie mask that I had. And that was my Jason mask. But there's just no way. I'm sure there's people who love it as much as me, but I can assure you nobody loves that character like more than me. Like as, in terms in of being room a filmmaker, love that character yeah. more than Damien. <laughs> I didn't think they're, so. They're afraid. No, okay, they're afraid. <laughs> yeah. They're afraid. I'm not afraid. I want to hear your three-year-old Jason underwear Batman story. Well, <laughs> I was thinking as penance, you need to post a picture of yourself in that outfit for being late. And, and David, what what do we have you do? Oh, what, what do you mean? Choose your own punishment for being late. Choose my own punishment for being late. Oh, my God. Oh. Any of you have ideas? I know what it is. Mm? You can't speak for 20 minutes. Oh, you are mean. <laughs> you are mean. Why are you mean to me? I love you. <laughs> Pantomime your apology. If you're like, Art, you're late. <laughs> Thank you so much, guys. You've been amazing. Thank you guys for your patience. I'm so sorry we were late. Are you guys going back Thank to your you tables so much. now to yeah. sign yes. shit? Yes. Go buy their shit. Woo! <laughs>